Ladies and gentlemen, wonderful podcast listeners, this is Henry Rollins letting you know that this show is sponsored by NatureBox. NatureBox ships tasty, guilt-free snacks right to your door. With over 100 flavors to choose from, like mini Belgian waffles, strawberry lemonade fruit stars, and sweet and salty nut medley, you'll never get bored of snacking again. On a personal note, I find myself very partial to the cheddar cheese and caramel popcorn. Wow. Try Nature Box for free. Let's stop for a moment and highlight free. that. That's right. It is free. Try Nature Box for free by going to naturebox.com slash Henry and Heidi. That's naturebox.com slash Henry and Heidi. It's delicious. And it's free. Free. I, I have no idea what this means to you. Pinball. Yes, but as far as meaning, to, to begin a podcast, <laughs> like the, the wonderful listener turns the podcast on and they hear Roger Daltrey getting the inspiration. That's what I was thinking. And Townsend working together like, we, should, we need to write a song. Exactly. About a guy who's a wizard, isn't he? And then Elton John comes out with his big shoes. Yeah. But, and goes into Pinball Wizard. But before Elton, it was just them blokes, isn't it? Ah, that was all an awful imitation of a British person. <laughs> <laughs> and in... Some of these sound effects are really weird. Like it goes from this like into a car wreck, but it still says pinball. So I don't know what to tell you about that. But anyway, um, let's fade that out. Uh, wonderful listener. My name is Henry Rawlings, and I've learned how to say that without laughing. And the other voice that you just heard is... Hi, me. Heidi and I, we go eat at a place, usually Monday mornings by like 9.20 or thereabouts. You can find us rolling into a really nice place. Uh, Heidi is usually an iced tea person, <laughs> but she's also a coffee person. And I've told you about this before. She is like, B order some coffee, which means, oh, Heidi wants coffee. So it's Heidi's coffee, but I'm drinking it. And one time I'd sipped some and the lady said, like, would you like a refill? And she looked over, the, the, Heidi looked over at the nice lady and said, yes. Please. Please. <laughs> so anyway, Heidi has this diabolical drink, which she swears tastes good. You've heard of the Ar Ar Arnold Palmer, which I don't know what it is. It's something and something. Iced, iced tea and, and lemonade. Okay. Heidi May, we called it the Heidi May until we come up with something better. <laughs> she'll, she'll knock off about half of her iced tea and then she'll say, pour some coffee in. <laughs> and at first I thought she was kidding. And I, I said, that, that won't taste good. No, I, that's what I want. And she took the hot coffee and poured it in and she starts drinking it. I'm like, ugh. And she said, oh, it's delicious. delicious. Just see, perfect. <laughs> and so now when she can remember, she gets the iced tea, she finishes half of it. And then she asks the, the nice person if they have iced coffee. And the guy will come over like, oh, this is, you had tea. She says, no, 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 no. Put in the coffee. And now we say, it's a, it's a Heidi May. She's drinking a Heidi May. She That's goes, because you're evil and got me back on coffee. Aha. Uh -huh. Poor, poor Heidi. She's around <laughs> Henry. The but it is good. And you tried it yesterday and you tried to act like you didn't like it. But you I loved didn't. it. You loved it. I so did not love yeah, it. Yeah, you did. It's, it tasted like exactly what you think it tastes like. It tastes like coffee and tea. It comes in like tea, but it ends on coffee. It's just like, no, 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 and no. <laughs> I love it. It's the Heidi May. It's the best of and both worlds. I reckon, oh boy, I reckon before September, she's going to put away a few barrels of it if the heat <laughs> keeps up like this. So thank you so much for tuning in and thank you so much for your cards and letters. We have gotten a lot of requests. We write them down and we utilize them. So thank you for doing that. Heidi, do you have anything that you want me to expound upon today? Yes, but I want you to promise me one thing. Yes. Before we, don't throw up. No throwing up? Why would I throw up? What do you mean? You were up all night trying oh, oh. to beat back your barf. Oh, <laughs> gee, I love the alliteration <laughs> on that. Beat back the barf. That's a t that's that's a t-shirt. Last night around 0312, I was having weird dreams about Johnny Thunders and the Heartbreakers, <laughs> having just watched a bit of a insanely good and you know sad documentary 
called Looking for Johnny about Johnny Thunders and the New York Dolls. And I, you know those dreams you have when your body's saying, wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up, where they make the dream so unendurable? Not scary, just like, this is really stupid. I dreamed that I had to pour Heartbreaker songs out of a pitcher into cups to listen to them. And it was very difficult to do. Basically, my body was saying, wake up, you have business to do. So I woke up and I'm covered in sweat and I'm hot and cold and hot and cold. And I said, wow, as he now affects a Glaswegian accent, I think I'm gonna puke. And so as soon as I stood up, everything in me said, oh, you are gonna hurl, oh. which is just one of the worst feelings that you actually get kind of good at as an adult. As a kid, it terrified me. Like, oh no, I'm gonna convulse. But as an adult, you're like, oh, here we go again. Hug a tree and I didn't know we were going to spend so much time on this. Well, you brought it up. Well, I just don't want you to do it while we're podcasting. Beat back the bar. Beat back the bar. <laughs> and so I was up and down, up and down, aching like I, I received a Singapore caning until the early hours. And here we are now. And so I told all this to Heidi May. And she, the first thing, like, oh, do you feel, do you feel okay? No sympathy. Like, you're not going to barf, are you? <laughs> I asked you, should I make an appointment with a doctor? Because something's up. You've been sick for a couple of weeks. And then... And you're never sick. And then, you're not going to barf. <laughs> so anyway, I, Heidi, I will do my best not to, not to barf. Okay, good. Yeah, okay. <laughs> anyway, so Heidi May. Yeah. If you have anything you'd like me to talk about, lay it on me. Well, I hope we haven't made the audience sick at this point. No. Um, they're sturdy. Well, I thought it would be good, and we've gotten tons of requests, to talk about the Rise Above album. Okay. In order to understand Rise Above, which is, we're talking about Rise Above 24 songs to benefit the West Memphis Three. That was a benefit record that I worked on insanely hard. Heidi was the octopus woman answering like 80 phone calls an hour. She was the, basically, you were the EP on that. You were the executive producer. You were basically kind of the nexus. Yeah. Everything came through you. Mm -hmm. And without Heidi, we wouldn't have made the record or we may have made it, but it wouldn't have really been nearly as good because Heidi has great organizational capacity. Like she knows how to produce, like she can get it all in one place and get people to show up. You have to be tenacious, which, uh... <laughs> oh boy. That's why I have all the lines in my face is because she's tenacious. Anyway... In 2000, 2001, or thereabouts, uh, our sound man, Daryl, Daryl said, I taped this off HBO. There's a documentary that you need to watch. And it was Paradise Lost Part One, I believe. And it's an HBO documentary on the West Memphis Three. In the summer of 1993, May, in Robin Hood Hills, in uh, West Memphis, Arkansas, three eight-year-old boys were found murdered. And three teenage boys, Damian Eccles, Jesse Miss Kelly Jr., and Jason Baldwin, were made for the crime. And I'm telling you things that you already know, but for those of you who don't, what ensued was one of the craziest, most unbelievable mock trials you've ever seen that sadly was real, that was covered very well by this documentary. And you're looking at these three guys, and there's just nothing about them says guilty, which is kind of hard to evaluate watching a, a video. But what is being put to prosecute them? Well, we know that they're, they worship Satan and we're gonna bring in our satanic expert who got his degree online from an online university that's now closed. I mean, it was a, an awful trial and I'm not wanting to give sympathy where it's not warranted, but the West Memphis Police Department needed to close this case right now. You have three dead children Someone needs to be the bad guy and they need to go away now. And it was Damien, Jesse, and Jason. And they were immediately sent away. Jesse and Jason getting uh, life and Damien Eccles getting death. So it was real. And when you watch this documentary, you're like, this can't be happening. This is, this is just a bad made for TV movie, right? But it was real. And I, it moved me, it upset me. It, tr it, it troubled me because I looked at these three guys, you know, with their mullets in there. He had a Slayer record. I'm like, I don't have a mullet, but I got a Slayer record. They don't fit in in high school. Hello, that's me and at least nine tenths of everyone listening. I mean, who fits in in high school who's interesting at all? 
And so the whole band watched it and I just got really fired up. So I said, let's do something. And so between Mike, road manager Mike, and management in Los Angeles, we assigned one of our shows in Los Angeles at the Troubadour to be a benefit show. And it was Rollins Band, I think Exine was on the bill, and I'm forgetting who else, was Wayne Kramer on the bill? Anyway, we had all these cool bands donating signed things, Bad Religion, um, Tom Waits gave us things, and we auctioned them off, it's all going to the West Memphis Three Defense Fund. And so I got back from the gig that night, and I'm still just, okay, we did a nice thing, but it's a gesture. I want to do more. These three guys, in my opinion, are innocent. And if someone doesn't really intervene, one's going to die and two are going to die later in prison. This is not right. And I couldn't sleep. Around 3.30 in the morning, as you do, your, your thoughts get huge. And I said, we're going to do like a benefit something, a benefit 45, like three songs. And like, of the Rollins band, who's going to buy it? And then one thing leads to another. And I got what I thought was a really good idea. We will learn a bunch of Black Flag songs. People seem to like that music. And we'll get a bunch of really cool rock stars to come in and sing them. And we'll, I'll call in favors. And we will utilize the fact that so many bands know who Black Flag is and like the band. And we're at maybe perhaps at one time inspired by the band. And we'll basically call in favors, call in markers and ask favors. And so I go to the office the next day. And I tell everyone at the office and everyone said, yeah, this was a time when Heidi was not working at the office. She was doing other stuff. What were you up to again? I went back to television for a second. Right. So she was in TV production. Again, she can make it, you know, she just gets tons of stuff arranged. So I called Heidi, I think on my StarTac cell phone, <laughs> like me and me and Barney Rubble had that phone. And I called her and I said, here's what I'm doing but I can't do it without you. I, I need someone who can keep calling and calling and calling and just kind of arrange a bunch of cats. You know, get a bunch of musicians to show up to do something. It's, you know, good luck. I can't do it because I don't have the human skills and I'm going to be in the studio. And she did some research. I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but she did her research and went, wow, this is, this is awful. And Heidi came on board. And when Heidi jumped in, I knew in, in my mind, I said, we're going to get this done because if you got Heidi, you're, you're going to win. And so we, I said to my bandmates, you want to learn a bunch of Black Flag songs? And you know, Jim and Marcus and Jason are some of the most good to go humans I have ever met. They're like, wow, we're on it. I mean, they, they got to work so fast. Like they were on it as it came out of my mouth. They were nodding enthusiastically. And so I said, okay, the band is cooking. I, I knew they would say that. I, got, I need an engineer. I need a studio. I need, I need, I need, I need, I need. And so I start putting calls out. Heidi starts putting calls out. And I found out how quickly I wasn't good at this stuff. I got an engineer and I got the studio. And that's about all I could get. And so Heidi and I think of, let, let's get the low hanging fruit first. Who's an easy touch? Keith Morris. He was in the band, in my, in my opinion, the best vocalist Black Flag ever had. And Keith is a real, he's a solidly good guy. And for something like this, you know he's going to say yes. So he contacted Keith and he said, are you kidding? I'm in. And then I said, okay, he was easy. I contacted Dukowski of Black Flag. I said, you want to be in? He said, I'm in. So those are kind of the easy ones. I contacted Kira of Black Flag and she said, yeah, I'm in. And I brought in my friend Shawnee. Who, who really, he knows a lot of people. Yeah, his name is Sean with an uh, yeah. initial E. So Shawnee. Shawnee. So we're calling in these people we know. Like we know that Hank 3 is a fan of Black Flag and we, we, from all reports, he's a cool guy and he is. He's cool as the day is long. Mike Patton, he's easy. He's smart. He knew all about the case. He came in like done. But Shawnee, man, Sean... I, I said, here's my list of people I want. He just said, no, 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 no. You're in the last century. He goes, here's who you need. Corey, Slipknot. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, you can get him. And he's, we were standing in the front of the office on your side. And he just pulls out a cell phone. And he just goes like, dude, Shawnee, I got Henry Rollins here. No, dude, I'm not <laughs> kidding. It's him. Stop freaking out. Stop freaking out. Stop yelling. Calm down. 
Okay, dude, here he is. And, you know, Corey has a, a, uses every word. <laughs> like, no, me, mm. way. And I told him all about it. And he said, whatever you want. Yeah. And I said, we'll send the tape. He said, no, no, I'm flying out. I'm flying out on my, I said, well, I can't. He said, no, no, on my dime. I got this. Like, he's so cool. He was so. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. And so Shawnee and Bill Fold, Bill Fold. Bill Fold. Bill Fold is another guy, a Coachella guy, who also has a huge Rolodex. And they're helping us. And we're finding out that the music world is very friendly towards our project. Not the managers, but the band people are just exceptional. And they got us to Queens of the Stone Age. Like one phone call. And Ryan like, Adams. Yeah, man. And, and, and Ryan Adams. And all Mars this, Volta guys. So completely cool. Yeah, uh, Cedric and Omar. Mm -hmm. Amazing. And so we're making phone calls and we're getting it together. My bandmates and I, we are laying down these tracks. And I'm thinking, you know, Iggy. Of course. Iggy, Iggy doing Fix Me. So I contact Iggy and I said, here's, here's what's up. Here's the case. Here's your paperwork to, to read. Here's the song I want you to cover. Here's a lyric sheet in case you're interested. And so one day, there's a message blinking on the message machine. I hear it. And like my, just every hair on my arm stood up. I said, Heidi, get in here. <laughs> I said, listen to this. And I hit play. Hey, Henry, it's Iggy. I'm going to do Fix Me. Well, uh, okay. And I'm like, he's in. And the sad thing is you kept that message for years and, and you just lost it. Deleted it. And that, I had the, that was like the who's who on that message machine. I, it was Ian Crank calling me. It's like, hey, Henry, it's, uh, it's Waits. Uh, Tom Waits left a message. So I found him one of his vinyl records. It says, Waits, uh, thanks for finding me, uh, Swordfish Trombones. Or, and then like, beep, Henry. It's Bill Shatner. How are you? <laughs> just beep, beep. Oh my God. It was just the cavalcade of stars. It was the best. And, and then one day I, I accidentally just, I, I'm like, no, no. And they're gone, 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 gone. Anyway, um, suddenly we have all of these people and we're arranging, we're sending tape to people. We're like, I, would send, I would send the documentary to people. Mm-hmm. And then if they were interested, I'd have to send the contract that you're not getting anything, you know, right. that everyone had to sign. It was a lot of work. Then I had to go to Greg Ginn because Gail, our lawyer, said, okay, there's, you have at least one huge obstacle that you should have come to me before you did all this. She said, you need to deal yeah. with publishing. Mm -hmm. Because if it's full rate, like 24 songs, the cost of the record will be like $25 unless you go pro rate on the publishing. So she contacted Greg as a lawyer, like, here's what Henry's doing. And I contacted him like, look, here's oh, what we're doing. Did? I wrote him. I wrote him and he actually wrote me back, which is incredible. I can't remember that. Oh, this. yeah. I wrote him. I said, look, Greg, here's what we're doing. Wow. And here's why we're doing it. That goes I, to show you how passionate you are about that, th these guys getting out of jail. Oh, I was sick to For my you stomach. to have to contact It made me so him. nervous. And I just was, I just was in, not into it, but I, I can't not. And I said, What were you nervous about? Just, I just don't want to deal with a guy. Right. It's so, it's so incredibly unpleasant. Right. And so I write him. I said, look, here's what we're doing. Or here's what we want to do. But in order to get it done, we need you to do this. There's no money in it. Actually, I'm paying for the record. Here's what's at stake. I can't think of any music that is more battle hymns that, that you take into to war than black flag music. I mean, it is the ultimate soundtrack to getting pe a prison break. I mean, who else do you use? And I'm getting these killer, you know, my bandmates are like working their butts off learning this music and they're, they're so into it. And we have all these amazing vocalists. I said, man, we got Iggy Pop doing Fix Me. I mean, come on. And he wrote back this letter. He was really cool. He said, I get it. And I'm going to go along with the prorate publishing, which he basically he takes like a, a discount. Like he basically, you have it. So you get publishing on like 10 songs instead of like 24. It's like, it's like half. I, I don't know how it works legally, but he did that mm -hmm. for, for us. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile... 
you know, you're at the office swatting down phone calls. I'm in the studio, so I'm also producing the record. So I'm producing vocal sessions, band takes. One of the greatest moments was a great song by Des Cadena, the Black Flag called Thirsty and Miserable. There's only one person in my mind who can sing it. And I don't know if you're, if you're at all familiar with the chorus. Thirsty and miserable, always wanting more. Thirsty and miserable. It, it's a melody that I think there's no other person to sing it besides Des other than Lemmy of Motorhead. Not because it's about drinking. It's just because his voice fits the melody. And, and I, I think maybe Des had kind of written it as kind of a Motorhead-ish song. But it's not about... The song's about alcohol, but I didn't want to go to Lemmy, hey, it's about drinking, you drink, because a lot of people drink. But I just heard him in his Lemmy voice going, thirsty and miserable, and just crushing it. And so we called Lemmy, who's like one of the more stand-up guys. He's just a, he's an excellent human. He's one of my favorites. And I said, do you know about this case? He said, no. I said, can I send your people some stuff to read? And he's a big reader. He read up and he said, yeah, I'm in. Because you're asking me, Henry, I'm in. So anticipating Lemmy's arrival, Dark Mike goes to the liquor <laughs> store and buys the largest, you know that, like that basket-sized bottle of Jack, Jack Daniels? Daniels. So it's like, what a, like, it's like a fish tank. Huge. <laughs> he buys that bag of ice, Coca-Cola. I pick up Lemmy at his apartment and he's, He's just, he's, I really dig the guy, not only musically, but as a human being, he's, he's really a good man. And so I'm filling him in on what we're doing and he's all, all in there, you know, all into it. We get to the studio, he meets everyone. Everyone's like lining up to meet him, you know, handshakes all around. He sees the Jack Daniels, the ice and the Coke. It's like he expected it. He didn't say, hey, look, it's a drink or may I have some? He just walked right over to it, fixed himself a drink drank like a third of it kind of like you know ah all right what are we doing and like he knew the song you know he practiced and we put him in the in the vocal room and he just did it i mean he's a pro he just nailed it and i said hey let me just for kicks do you mind like trying it again he's like yeah he did it again he doubled the chorus which i don't know if we use or not but he's like a consummate professional you didn't have to walk him through it he didn't have to go, okay, let me, he just went in and just hit it. Then he hung out with us for a while. We played him other songs on the thing because we were so proud to play it for people. And he, he had had a couple of drinks, hung out with us. We did all the photos. He was very cool about it. And then I took him back home. And I, I, it's, I feel really bad about all this because Heidi said, when Lemmy's in the studio, promise you will call me so I can show up. And I said, you got it. And I completely spaced out. Thanks. And she is, she was mad. Well, I didn't go to the studio for anybody because I was too busy at the office I know. doing all and that. And that was other a Saturday work. session. That's why it you was could a go. Saturday session. I could have, I could have gone, but somebody forgot. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> anyway, that happened, and so a lot of things like this happened. And I, I know that we're talking about the making of the record a bit long, but it was so awesome the way the studio Cherokee said oh they were cool to us too oh so cool they're like the rob family they're yeah. like the nicest people they said okay we're giving you the studio at like cost mm -hmm. plus like you know electricity because we don't want any money we love what you're doing we love you because i did so much recording there black flag recorded there i you know I, i've been in there so many times they said and one of the rob brothers the owners he was our engineer and he goes i, I got this don't worry about it just you know give me a sandwich at lunchtime he's like the nicest guy and they just came they just came in and said whatever you need you got it but we got employees we need to cover i said yeah of course so they gave us a studio for next to nothing free engineer um we were talking to you know dark mike is like hey string company can we get some strings for this project what do you need and everyone just came in like the coolest and so we're ripping through these songs singers are coming in and just laying it down Tom Araya comes back from tour. He said at one point, I'm going to be on tour 21 more days. Give me one day to kind of recover, see my kids, and I'll come in. Like 22 days later, he walks in. Hey, you guys, I'm Tom. And like, you're in Slayer? He's like the nicest guy. I, I don't think I'd ever met him before. 
It's like, hey, man, this is, it, it's a raw deal what these guys got. I said, would you mind? You got three of your fans in prison. I got three lyric sheets. I want to send them of the song. Would you sign them? And he signed them for each guy. And I said, you are going to, you're really going to pump these guys up. He does, he, he said, okay, you ready? I'm like, are you ready? I gave him the lyric sheet. He goes in there and just annihilates it. Like, perfect. It's not my imagination. I'm like, my hair stood up. I'm like, he's doing it. And I said, just for kicks, you mind? It's like a 40 second song. I do it again. He's like, yeah, sure. We did, we used the first take, I think. And he did it again. Great. He's okay. Uh, I gotta go. Uh, I gotta go. I'm like, okay. He had to go like do you know, some errand. Shook his hand, did some photos. And he took off. And they were all like that. Queens of the Stone Age. Everybody. Um, the Mars Volta guys. They came in. They hung out. Ryan Adams. Corey. You know, everyone gave their time. Yeah. Corey flew in. On his own paid, dime. Paid for his hotel. Stayed at like what? One of those nice. Paid at the hotel down the street. Yeah. And, the standard. Yeah. And what we did because we couldn't pay anybody is we would let people come over and take merch. You know, get in the van. Yeah. Sweatshirts. Whatever they wanted. They came and, yeah. and took and but the generosity that yeah. was extolled upon the project was better I, I didn't know what to expect but i didn't expect that you got it man i know whatever you need it was awesome so cliff norell the great engineer and i are mixing forget where Cl skip sailors or you know we're mixing just go 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 we have like a 24 23 songs to mix or 24 songs and like no time because like we're running out of you know the fund and you know the, the budget and we're going 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 and we're like just making it happen like are you tired yes can you keep working yes we just did it our eyes are crossing meanwhile we get to the last song we're going to mix rise above which is the first song on the record arguably in my opinion one of the best songs i've ever heard in my life it's just it is bomb proof it's perfect on every level and so we're mixing it and those guitars come on, that crazy feedback, man. You just get, you just want to jump out of your chair. And I heard this voice in my head. I heard, to me, the voice of ultimate justice, Chuck D of Public <laughs> Enemy. There is no voice like that I have ever there heard. There really isn't. There really isn't. It's so the bottom it's line. giant. Yes. It's like this cavern. And I said, Chuck's got to start this record. And I had this idea. West Memphis, Arkansas. Doo! The feedback comes on. I heard it in my head. So I contact Chuck, who, you know, we're pals. And I contact, I said, Chuck, this is so, la you know, no notice. Here's what I need. Did this idea pop? I'm not trying to just say you were like some weird thought at the last minute, but I just hear this in my head. This record, it, it, it's, a, the, it's a fuse and you're, you have to light it. The first song is like the drums. I go, it's you, man. And here's what I want you to say. So I'm telling you what to do and I need it now yikes and he wrote back in like five minutes i wrote him from the office i think and he said i got it i know about the case i'll be right back at you peace out chuck and the next morning we're going into mix and there's a a, a thin fedex envelope on the front porch of the office it is a cdr which i still have here somewhere of chuck d doing those lines every like 12 different ways and i brought it to cliff and we heard we're like Check you out, man. You are the man in a pinch. I mean, he just came through. When I first heard it, I got the chills. Oh, I, I almost, whenever I, almost, I, hear I it, lost my mind. I, I almost start crying whenever I hear it. Like when Chuck comes in, I get really, really emo. <laughs> and so we, we picked, you know, one of the early takes was like, what? Well, that's the one. We heard them all, but the one like take three was like, that's it. We fly it into the mix. We move it back. And I go, no, 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 a little higher, like a couple of hi-hats and then drop it. And so we dropped it and then Cliff said, like, how about a little like echo? I'm like, yeah. And we played it. I said, play it again. Play it again. I made him play the intro like like 10 times. I was just so thrilled of how at how good it sounded. And that like 36 hours ago, we were sitting in those two chairs thinking, hey, let's get Chuck D. And like, boom, he's on the record. And I wrote Chuck. I said, man, you you have elevated this record to it's now, it's now finished. Now with you on it, we are done. So that was 2002. We started work on that around uh, May, mid-May. In How long did we work on it? Because I just remember on and off for weeks. I remember on. working on adrenaline, and then when it was like done, 
needing a day off. Yeah. Well, just, you were on the phone all was day. Was it like six weeks? Like Something it was like really well, short. Th- yeah. But the thing that the tracking took only a few days because those guys are monsters. Right. But it was getting all the singers. Like we had to ship tape to Hank 3. Getting back contracts was. <sighs> we had to get tape to Mike Patton because he recorded in his own studio. Like tape was moving back and forth. And contracts were, you know, taking their sweet time. Anyway, we, we got the record done. And so that's 2002. And I thought we better tour and make some money on the road. Take these songs out, get the record out, promote the hell out of it and play every gig we can. And all the money is going to go to the West Memphis Three Defense Fund, to the lawyers, to get new evidence and, and whatever else. So in 2003, we practiced up. Uh, a tour from Tempe, Arizona to Tokyo, Japan was booked. And the, the, we had the, uh, the American leg and then the European leg and then the uh, Australia, Japan part, the Pacific Rim part, I guess, or whatever. And so for the first part, Keith Morris, the, the American part, Keith Morris comes out. And we kind of, he does like a, a six or seven song set at the beginning of Keith era songs, nervous breakdown stuff. And then I come out when they, with, with, they play Rise Above. We have two mics. He walks off stage. I walk on stage. The music never stops playing. And everyone's like, yeah. And, um, you know, Keith went out there every night. Oh, my God. He's, He's a, on fire. He, he was on fire at Soundcheck. Now, hey, uh, can we do this song for Soundcheck? And, you know, the mother superior, like, yeah. And I'm looking at him like, Save it for the show. I mean, the guy is, is in fifth gear. Like, Keith, Keith, Keith. It's so fun to watch. He is amazing. I mean, there's no... There's kind of on-off with that guy. Anyway, he was amazing. The tour was great. Well, you know, sold well. Jello Biafra came on stage oh, in yeah. San Francisco and sang Jealous again and just was incredible. He sang it so well. Anyway, we leave for Europe. We do all these European festivals. It was great. It was insane. You know, crazy crowds, like just people going nuts at our own gigs. And then the festivals we did were just madness. And then we go to, I think... I was in Amsterdam for that one, right? Yes. Yeah. At the Paradiso. Mm-hmm. And that's when they were rebuilding the Paradiso and they had the crazy dressing rooms, those prefab ones outside the venue. Because usually you stay inside underneath the stage. But on that day, they had those crazy trailers with the, the, on the, uh, the risers. And Heidi was uh, visiting the tour in Holland and she saw the show. And so we kept on playing and playing all the way to Tokyo, Japan. And that was the last show of the tour. And we, it was a great, you know, packed, packed venue, played really well and came home with a bunch of money. Uh, Dark Mike, the road manager, had a really good idea. He said, and we call him Dark Mike out of pure love. Yeah. We love him. But when he but goes you don't dark, want, you do not want to make him mad. Yeah, don't do Get it. Get out of the way. And so anyway, um, before the tour started, he goes, okay, you need to be unimpeachably politically correct on this tour. I said, what do you mean? He said, you can't get a penny off this. So I'm not even going to give you per diems. He said, the guys are going to get salary. You know, you got they have families and rent. Sure. And, you know, the bus driver has to get paid, obviously. He said, you, you're getting nada. Like nothing. Are you cool with that? I said, absolutely. And that way no one can say, you did this, which I was accused of later. You can't win. No, you can't win. No matter what. So anyway, there was one poignant moment that I think is worth talking about on the American tour. It was the most poignant moment of the entire tour as far as on the ground playing. We are in Memphis, Tennessee, near West Memphis, Arkansas, at the Daisy Theater, the new Daisy Theater. It's a really nice venue. And the owner, oh, I'll spare everyone. I won't mention his name. He's not a bad guy, but he, he got some threats. He got nervous. He got real nervous. We got death threats. Oh, I, I had to do press every morning. And you, you, you know, they give you like a one minute lead in. I'm doing those morning shows. So I'm sitting in like in my underwear at the front of a freezing air conditioned tour bus at like 5 a.m. to talk to, you know, big head road killing whatever the morning guys at some station. And I hear them talking about me before they lead me in. Well, we got this devil worshiper. Uh, he, he hates children because he's defending three baby killers. Oh, and so his name is Henry Rollins, if that can be believed. And he's going to defend his point of view right now. <sighs> well, good morning. Good morning, Mr. Satan. You're like, wow. And I'd have to diffuse 
and neutralize the guys so we could just talk mm -hmm. and go, okay, here's what you didn't know. And that takes up like three of the five minutes. And here's why we're doing this. Well, Henry, that, you know, I still have my doubts, but I, I understand what you're saying now. I'm like, okay, okay. So we don't have to call Henry yeah. uh, the, in league with baby killers and all that. But it, that was almost once a day. We get mm -hmm. that kind of morning radio. And the email we would get, yikes. Yeah. And incredible. And, you know, personal threats. And so we get to M Memphis, beautiful city, wonderful people. And the owner of the venue <laughs> contacts Dark Mike. Oh, no. He said, I, I want to cancel the show. <laughs> we are getting threats to the venue. Mm -hmm. The ticket vendors are getting threats. Mm -hmm. Like, if you sell a ticket for that show, we're going to burn your place down. So they're not selling tickets to the show. So it's going to be walk up. A picket has been promised. They, people are going to picket the show. I want to cancel it. And Dark Mike relayed to me what he said to the owner of the venue. Okay. I want to hear it. Most of it I have to leave out is because I like to keep our language on the show. Do, you can do bleeps, but let's hear it. Hey, beep. <laughs> You're doing the beep show. <laughs> Don't be such a beep, beep, <laughs> click. <laughs> Oh my God, this is why I love him so much. That's, that's a message from, that's a love letter from Dark Mike. Oh my God. And it was that, it was like a sentence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, okay, it was on. So we, we pull in in the afternoon and the bus is behind the venue, which is behind the street. There's like an alley for the bus to pull in. So we are sequestered away from anything that's happening in the front of the venue. I mean, I don't even know if I've see, ever seen the front of the venue because I always meet people at the bus behind the venue. And so one of those like local news guys comes in and you can tell he's just like on his phone, like, okay, I think he's here. Are you Henry Rollins? I'm like, yes, sir. Hey, can we get uh, five minutes with you for local news? I'm, and you never know what you're gonna get with these guys. Yeah, but they're always looking for conflict. Right. And so the guy said, hey, uh, this you know, controversial guy, and, and, and that's my lead in. Like, well, he's defending these three men in prison for killing little kids, Henry Rollins. I'm like, wow. It's that you're kind of yeah. damned if you do or don't. Mm -hmm. So I, I did my best to neutralize and, and inform. Here's why we're doing it. We're just looking for money to test evidence. That's it. If they're guilty, no doubt the evidence will show it. We need more evidence. And he, he couldn't argue with that because a, that's a good corner to come fighting out of. Because what if they are guilty? What we're doing is going to nail them. So why, you know, we're being impartial in a way. We're saying to these lawyers, here's a bunch of money. Go test your DNA. Go do your thing. And if they get nailed, well, now we know and we're happy to help. Because mm -hmm. who, who likes a baby killer? But in my mind, the three are innocent. Me too. I mean, no doubt to mm -hmm. me, especially at that point. And it be, had become a very emotional thing because it's, now it's personal. We're on this tour. You made this record. You're communicating with the three. You're communicating with the lawyers and you're getting to see stuff and hear stuff that no one else exactly. does. Exactly, which like, makes it really hard. It, it, it was hard. Because you knew stuff the public didn't know. Yeah, and I couldn't tell you. And yet. you couldn't say anything. And I saw photos that no one should have to see and you, I now no longer wonder why detectives can be so angry. I saw, I saw photos that are right. so, uh, no one should see that. Anyway, we, I spend the afternoon behind the venue. People are coming in just like punters, like walk, hey man, I went to school with Damien, he's really cool. Everyone knows they, those guys didn't do it. Man, you guys are righteous. Like, oh thanks, get it, buy a ticket, buy a t-shirt. Like, you know, we need money. And we're getting no aggression and all of a sudden, Two news guys come in and they're moving really fast. There's an entourage, there's an island of people moving quickly towards the bus. And now there's like this uneasy excitement, like, uh oh, uh oh, uh, stand up, get up, something's happening. I'm like, okay. And I'm like, what's happening? Because it's not, it's not good. Something is up. It's, it's Ms. Hobbs, mother mm -hmm. of one of the deceased children. And I recognize her from the documentary. Her new boyfriend or husband, I forget. Her other children, maybe one or two friends, some other people, and the news people. And they're looking for some knockdown, drag out, you better, you know, yelling or whatever. They, they want probably the worst it gets, the better it is for 7 p.m. Sexy news, they call it. I had been rehearsing 
meeting one of the parents for months because I thought there might be a chance. And if I ever did, I really wanted to be very careful and very simple, not overword it, because these people lost their children in the most horrific way. I have nothing but sympathy and, and horror for what they go through day after day. I, I have no imagination as to what that kind of grief is like. I, I know grief, but I don't understand not like that. That down to your DNA grief. Mm-mm. So I meet Miss Hobbs, who's incredibly nice. And I said, Miss Hobbs, I'm I'm so glad to get to meet you. And the camera guys are zooming in. And anytime the boyfriend or whatever this fellow was moved, they move to him because they think he's gonna give me an uppercut or something. And I said, I'm so I can't explain to you how sorry I am. I I'm not gonna insult the situation by trying to to I'm so sorry please if you would let me explain what we're doing and why we're doing it and in the most succinct terms I said we're looking for evidence you know, we're making money to look for evidence we are not pro satan we're not pro baby killer we are pro truth and in our opinion the trial was not all it could have been any american deserves all the justice he or she can get no matter who they are innocent guilty wretched and she said, I agree. And I said, okay, we are raising money so the lawyers can test evidence, affidavits, witness testimony, that's all. If we are upsetting you in any way by doing this, I understand and I can't apologize to you enough. You've been being dragged through this for years. I'm so sorry, but this is what we're doing. And she said to me, I'll never forget, she said, well, God bless you. I understand, thanks for explaining. and." Personally, I've never been sure about their guilt. Mm. And I said, okay, Mm -hmm. so we have some room for, we can have a civil conversation. It is summertime, Tennessee. It is so hot. Like we're standing there sweating, talking to each other. You just stand outside and cook. The camera guys, now the camera's like, uh, you know, they're they're wearing a dump truck on their shoulder. The camera guys are not taking breaks because we're not giving them Exactly. We're giving them civil discourse. Mm. They want conflict. Yeah, they want us to be, you know, we, they want me to get hit or yelled at or something. Mm-hmm. She hugs me. Aww. The husband boyfriend shakes my hand. I meet her, the family members, and they all said, hey, it's a great thing you're doing. It's, it's an honor to meet you. I'm like, okay. Then they wanted autographs. Okay. And the camera guys literally left. Right. Because we weren't, you know, it wasn't going to be that thing. Mm-hmm. And I, I said, I said, Ms. Hobbs, you've given me so much wind under my wings to have you be at least okay. Now I'm good to go because I got a parent. Let me ask you a question. So Lori Davis was at that show. That's Damien's wife. Yeah. Did those two get to meet? Do you remember? I have no memory of that. Okay. I, I remember Lori showing up much later. Okay. This is like three in the afternoon. Okay. We haven't even sound checked. And to my knowledge, Ms. Hobbs... And, and family did not come to the show. They, okay. We made a meeting and they left mm-hmm. peacefully. Mm-hmm. Like, so nice. I said, okay, now I got her on my shoulder. Look out. Here I right. come. The show went off fine. There was a small picket thing with not much enthusiasm. The show packed out. No one vandalized. No one, there's no violence. There's no threatening. I remember making you email me after every show, though, because I was nervous. Yeah. No, you know, surprisingly, from Tempe to Tokyo, it was like a normal Rollins band tour. People hanging out. I know, after but we were, see, I'm getting the oh, email. Oh, I know. But what I'm saying to you is no one, like, you know, spray painted the bus. Right. No one vandalized. No one said, hey, after the show, I'm going to cut your head off. I mean, but we were getting emails saying, I'm going to kick your ass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So no. I would be, I would say, email me. Yeah. But, you know, and, and we had, you know, every night I'm out meeting people post show, Dark Mike has instructed, okay. I got, you're going to be there. You're going to be there. If anyone raises their hand towards Henry, neutralize him. Just take, put him down and I'll take care of the rest. Like I'll deal with the guy. But I, <laughs> I was always, there's always someone within an arm's length to neutralize some guy running up. But Dark Mike's like the Hulk. He can lift up a car and you know, throw it's, it. It's, it's, it's not, not a good day for me. <laughs> but Mike was looking out. Oh yeah. You know, throughout the show. And afterwards, for you never know. You know, guy walks up with a gun. I mean, who knows? People are crazy. Mm -hmm. But there was not a a bit of that. And after that show, all these young people, youngish, came up to me and said, "Hey, 
I knew the three of those guys. This is BS. Like, they didn't do it. And one guy said, you know, I went to high school with Damien. Everyone in town knows they're innocent. Like, we all know. It's the biggest open secret in West Memphis, Arkansas. Like, are you kidding? And then everyone had these theories. And so in a, a twist of irony, years later, we're on tour and we played 2010, 2012. We play the Daisy Theater and we're on the bus. Tim, the bus driver, he... Wait, is this, this is spoken word. Yeah. Yeah. But years later, this is a quick story. We leave the Daisy Theater and he goes, hey, we're going to park up and get the bus washed and get it fueled. There's a place. He said, you know where this bus place is? I go, no. He goes, it was built on the site those three kids were found at. Oh, no. And I said, get out of town. He goes, no, no. Like, they built over it to, like, erase it. And so I get out and I talk to one of the guys who washes the bus. I said, this is, he goes, yeah, man, basically, you're standing on it. Mm. And I just sat in the bus you know, it takes like an hour to get all this stuff done. Just going, man, I think I did a journal entry from it. Like I am, I am in it. I'm sitting on top of the crime scene. It was so heavy and sad and awful. Yeah. Anyway, we, we did the record. We did the tour. The tour was over by late summer, 2003. And so where do you go after that? You know, I did more benefit shows, you know, spoken word. Uh, magazines would say, Hey, you're coming to our town do a 1,000 word article on the West Memphis area, done. So I would do these op-eds. I would just kind of put a light on it in the best way I could. I would do like shows at the Largo, or whatever, and I'd devote one night to West Memphis 3 and send the check. And so as the years go by, you find out that with the money that was made by the Rise Above Record and the Rise Above Tour, that was the money that went into the DNA testing of the crime scene evidence that the state of Arkansas would not pay for. And this was the decisive evidence that got them the new day in court. And so we didn't knock all the pins down, but the Rise Above record and the tour really helped get the ball rolling. We were like the big to get the thing going. And the lawyer would write me go, you know what, thanks to you, we have evidence. So thank you. And I talked to Lori and she's like, you guys, I thank you. And she's so nice. And so Years and years and years go by, and Damien and I, you've seen my batch of correspondence from Damien, the, the gifts mm -hmm. he would make me, like the paintings and everything. Just, Out of coffee. Yeah, he would paint using instant coffee. Amazing. Amazing. And so at one point, I'm up in the kitchen at the office. This is uh, 2011. Phone rings, which is rare. It's Lori. She goes, okay. I've got something that uh, the lawyer said only friends and family can know. And you and Heidi are friends and family. And so the boys are getting out next week. And I said, uh-huh, hold on. Let me, let, me, I, I, let me pick myself up off the floor. Let me get my jaw. Huh? She said, they're getting out. They're getting out and you can't say a word. I said, what, new trial? She goes, no. And I had to, you know, she said, this thing called an Alfred plea. I don't really understand it exactly, but look it up. It's a little tricky. I said, they're getting out. She goes, they are getting out. This is happening. And I, I, I said, I think I'm going to faint. She goes, no, I, I, I said, am I dreaming? She goes, you know, whatever, like Thursday. I'm like, oh, okay. I said, Heidi and I will keep it. You know, no problem. We're good with secrets. She, she signs off. I called you. I said, well, here's what. And I was in Venice Beach on Abbott Kinney. And, and you yelled or something. Well, I freaked out. Yeah. I was like, what? And I started shaking like I went in you got walk with your friend I yeah and I was with Chris and I was and I couldn't say anything right and I started shaking and I had to sit down and she said are you okay and I'm like yeah 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 it's just work stuff because I I wasn't allowed to say right. anything but I just my body had a physical reaction yeah you because you can't believe it like this no. thing's gonna be over like because you just because it, it would it had been, it's a, been decade. a decade and you're like nah I know. Nothing's going to happen. You know, they're going to be in there and Damien's going to die with a needle and no one's going to know anything. Anyway, later that day, I have to go do vocals on Marcus from Mother Superior, the bass player on Rise Above, on his solo record. So I said, yeah, I'll show up and do some spoken word thing. You don't want me singing. And so I go in there and Marcus is like, hey, man, what's happening? I'm like, well, uh, nothing. <laughs> I just can't tell him. And he's someone who should have known. So... Like two days later, boom, I'm off in Scotland at the Edinburgh Festival. 
And I'm, you know, jet lagging and I got like two or three theater shows in Edinburgh as part of the Fringe Fest. And I'm about to walk, I walk cross town to Soundcheck. I'm at some distant hotel and it's like a long, long walk. And I, I'll check the email one last time. So I go to the company website and I hit the mail. There's, I'm not exaggerating, there's like 25 emails. Dude, they're out. West Memphis 3 out. CNN.com. Check it. I mean, obviously they're out because we just got bucketed by email. So I go online to CNN.com and I watch the press conference. I'm like, and I'm sitting. I'm so glad I was sitting. I was numb. I'm like, wow, there's Damien with shades on being like <laughs> this cool kind of bored <laughs> hipster. And the other two are really earnest and they they were out. And then I had to walk to the venue. I had to go. You know, I had sound check and a very big show and all this stuff. And so I'm walking jet lagging with the traffic going, you know, quote, the wrong way. Where, you know, a guy like me just gets run over. So I had to be really careful to not, to not get run over and to not get lost. My head was so, I'm like, do I talk about this tonight? I don't know enough. I haven't prepared. I, I no. I'll, and so I said, I won't say anything. I'm just going to go do the material and the stuff I prepared because I'm not ready to talk about it. It's just too, too much. I would just would have rambled and been a maniac. And so the, all the whole time I was there, I did like two or three shows. I didn't say a word because I couldn't articulate it yet. Because like, I just couldn't believe that the iceberg had melted. I mean, I, I never thought it was going to happen. And then later on, I eventually met up with Damien which was a great day. And I always told him, I said, I, I don't come to visit you unless you want, if you want me to, I'll show right up. But here's why I haven't thus far. I don't want to meet you through some glass or in a visiting room, in, in a, you in a uniform with your laminate where you have to go and I leave some box. I want to meet you two free men in the free world, eye to eye, because you're not a guilty person. So I'm not going to meet you in a place where guilty people hang out if you don't mind. And he wrote back, he said, man, I get that. I said, if you want me to visit, I'll fly there tomorrow. No problem. You were adamant about that because I remember in the early days, I said, why don't you go down there and meet him? And you said, I'm going to meet him on the outside. Yeah. I, I just want to look him in the eye and say, like, here yeah. we are. With all those constitutional amendments are ours. And it took a while. And it happened in New York at the main branch of the New York Public Library, one of the most beautiful buildings ever. I'm in the hallway because we're going to do an interview in front of a sold out huge auditorium. And Lori comes in first. I hadn't seen Lori for a while. She goes, okay. He's downstairs talking to some people. He'll be up in a minute. Can't wait to meet you. Are you ready? I said, man, I've been ready since 2001. And he walks up and we hug each other and he grabs me by my head and kisses me on the cheek. <laughs> he went, he went Mwah! I love you, man. I said, yeah, damn, Damien. And here we are, just like I pictured it. Mm -hmm. Two men in the greatest city, you know, eye to eye. I, I said, this is what I wanted. And he said, yeah, I get it. And we did the interview that night in front of like this, I don't know, tons of people. And he is funny, intelligent, incredibly intelligent, articulate like you're jealous. You wish you had a tenth of it. And here we are now and they i don't i damien or Lori, one of them will write me every few months they're living in new york somewhere they're having a life i mean they're crazy in love with each other and damien's writing and doing his thing and Lori, i don't know what she's up to but you know they're they're living their lives you know two married people and i don't know what jesse and jason get up to they have a well as far as my radar they have a, a an incredibly low um, uh, reading. I, I don't know where they are, what they're up to. Because Damien was the one I, I kept in touch with the most. It was one of the most, I don't know how to describe it, one of the most involving experiences of my life where I kind of went in like, okay, hey, we'll do a show. We'll do a record. And it ended up being like, like 10 plus years of being emotionally involved in something. And I've never had an experience like that that comes close. I have nothing at all to compare it to. Nothing. Right. And the fact that there is, you know, all of this is bittersweet. Like the guys eventually got out of prison, but they gave their 
Their youth was taken from them. Yeah. And bad things probably happened to them as it will happen to a young person in prison that long. I, I don't know, but who knows? And, and, and they, they didn't do it. And there's some people out there who did an awful thing to three beautiful little boys. I mean, mm -hmm. your heart breaks when you see these kids. They're just, just fantastic, happy, you know, just, oh, it's awful. So there's, there's hardly any good parts. There's like the part that, did, that hurts a little less. You know what I mean? Like they got out, yeah, after nearly 20 years, but there's still all the parents of the deceased who are like in ag. Are you kidding? And the right, uh, and the person who did do it has not paid right. for it. And, and he's out there. And he's out there, or they're out there, who, whatever. And, and it just hasn't, the wrong hasn't been righted. Like not any of it. And the fact that the three guys got out, that's kind of like a band aid on a massive wound. I'm, I'm happy they're out. But justice was not served. There are adults in Arkansas who know. Mm -hmm. They know they did wrong. And so there's your story. And it's more frustrating and sad and infuriating than it is anything else. Uh, on the good side of things, it was great that we were able to make the record. Great that it was so good. And we did. I think we, I think we knocked it out. Well, to me, it's one of the most important things I've ever worked on. Yeah, for me, it might be... Probably the most important the thing most I've important. ever worked yeah, on. Yeah, I'd have to agree yeah. with you. I mean, Because the rest of it, it's all me, me, me. entertainment. Yeah, and this is, you're benefiting yourself. This you, was something else. Yeah, you're going... Uh, it's not about you. Well, it's funny because I started working with you in 96 or 97. Who knows? I don't remember. But then I left to go back into TV because mm -hmm. I was offered money. That, this, you calling me. <laughs> what are you trying to say? <laughs> you calling me to come in and work on that album is how we came back to working together. Mm -hmm. Well, I was only away for what, a year? Something like that. Yeah. But. It felt like an eternity. Honey. Well, what happened was, Henry, I was supposed to only come back for that. And look, what year was that? <laughs> What year was that? 2001 or 2? Two? 2001 or 2. Oh, my God. Now, I'm involved 2015. in... 2015. Yeah. It's supposed to be just for the Rise Above album. Now, I literally am involved in every it's aspect of your part. life. I run 213. And Rawlings. And Henry Rawlings. All things Henry Rawlings. I say to people, she is my life's showrunner which is kind of industry speak, a showrunner is someone who actually runs the show. Yes. And you are that, Heidi, old buddy. Yeah. Yes. So, so uh, that story was requested many times. Many times. That was, that was one of the biggest requests we got. Yeah. And one of the earliest. Yeah, right away. Yeah. Oh, no, the sound... <laughs> Heidi came into the office today with a massive headache. Uh, How is that headache? It's not that good. Really? I still have it. So it sounds like this. Ow! <laughs> <laughs> You're evil. I love my job. It is now time, you know that sound, it is time for Heidi's Headline. <laughs> I love this. Oh, yes. Oh, oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, this is great. Oh, we're going to have some fun. <clears throat> and this Hi Heidi's headline is fresh off the press. <clears throat> A company worth $2 billion asks Henry if they can use his image for two years and $2,000 to sell their product. <laughs> Henry schools them about getting real. <laughs> okay, you, did you hear that sound where Heidi May goes slightly nasal? That is when Heidi May is sincerely laughing. That's when she, when something is so funny, even she cannot stop it. Okay. A few days ago. No, it was yesterday. Yesterday? It was I got yesterday. A bad thing of time. It was great. Okay. Yesterday, we get an email from a person who works for the advertising wing 
of a company, we looked him up, who boasts a $2.2 billion projected expansion in profits by 2016. <laughs> they, this person shows me a photo of myself as a ute. Back and, in the day. Back in the day. And says, we like you very much for what you stand for. And we would like to use this image in a two-year campaign. Worldwide Worldwide buyout. Buyout. (laughs) And here's $2,000. And it's it's not that I'm money hungry. And it's not that $2,000 isn't a nice chunk of change. However, they want to use this thing all the time to make millions and millions of dollars selling a product they're not using the image of yours truly because they're nice and they like me i'm sure they are nice and they like me but they're trying to sell something so they're capitalizing on what they think i stand for and what does that mean to them henry we just think you're great okay you're a corporation talk to me in your language money well it means two thousand dollars (laughs) <laughs> Which basically says, hey, beep, you know, like, here's some money in be- uh, next to my ring finger as I backslap you into the middle of last week, sucker. And I am not, you know, too cool for school, but I disagreed with this, these people on principle. And I wrote back knowing that this person is not the boss. This person and the, this team gets a budget, and that's what the budget allows. That's that. They're getting static from up high. So this person, it's like yelling at the person behind the counter at the airport when the plane is late. Yeah, no, she was cool. Yeah. It's, Very and, cool. And it's not her no. problem. No. So I said, I, you're limited, and I get it. If 2K is your budget for <laughs> talent in a worldwide campaign, you are struggling. And so I said, your proposition is funnier than the Dave Chappelle, Rick James. Oh, yeah, that. And I said, and you might remember that was <laughs> funny. So I said, when your bosses, not you, when your bosses <laughs> are ready to deal in the adult world of business, you let me know, figuring I'd never hear back. Uh, the next day. No, it was all yesterday. All yesterday? Okay. <laughs> so uh, the several hours later, a few hours yeah. later, a letter comes back. Basically saying, I hear you. I agree. Yeah. However, this is what we've got. Is there any way we can work together? Which says to me, we have purchased the image. We have put the cart before the horse. We got the image. We paid that person in full. Now we need to get the idiot in the picture to say yes. We're not going to increase the budget. We're just going to reword the relationship. And they go into corporate speak. Is there any way we could move this to a friendlier, more agreeable <laughs> environment? Because we really want to work with you. Because you, th- we think you. I said, I know, I hear you. And I'd like to work with you too. And I named a price. I go, here's how much a year for the two years. And I basically said, and I know it's a, it's a no go. And I said, enough now. <laughs> yeah. But underneath that, you oh, cut yeah, and yeah, pasted yeah, yeah. underneath <laughs> that. Thank you. <laughs> underneath that, I cut and pasted an article. <laughs> I found out on some financial site <laughs> about this company and their ambitious plans for the next few years. It's basically, it's a big, uh, you know, uh, flex to uh, potential stockholders. We are going to do this and here's who we're doing it with. And we've already done this and we're worldwide and we're predicting this $2.2 billion expansion on our already multi gajillion dollar thing. (laughs) And I said, I said, I feel so great for you and the team from reading the below. Go get them enough now. I, I hope all is well, Henry Rawlings. <laughs> that was so 
and funny. I cc'd Heidi May on it. Oh, I w- I laughed. I I was seeing all of the emails. She was very cool, but man, because it's not her fault. No, it's not. She's just doing her job. But yeah. the audacity of well, this giant corporation. But that's how that's how they have. It's like shoe fly yeah, shoe. It, it, it's how you stay rich. You just treat people bad. It's uncool. Yeah. Now, period. I don't know. <laughs> and I know the kind of people, because I've done stuff with these people before, for free. I, I did one, a thing with them in 2008, remember? Yes, for remember? free. Yes, I do. And now it's just taking advantage. And I said, yeah, go ahead. You know, hey, we're having this party. You can come and we'll go hurrah. And we'll, we'll give you a, a free thing if you want. And you're like, uh-huh. Great. For 28 bucks, I'll buy my own. I mean, like, whatever. <laughs> it's like, a, you know, thanks. <laughs> thanks. As the Borscht Belt comedians used to say, thanks, Gandhi. And so it's like big deal. <laughs> and so it's how you stay rich. Now, as far as anyone else of my ilk for why they would put another face or person, say they switched me out, do you think they would be able to get away with that offer they offered me with anyone else? Of course not. But I love what you said about your work and all the sweat and all the tears and they just want to... Yeah, I, I said, so you're capitalizing on 30-some years of a lot of pain, <laughs> integrity, sweat, output, etc., to sell and make money. Yep. And that's what it's worth to you? Yeah. I think I'm seeing things for what they are, and I got it. Do you? <laughs> and the person wrote back and said, yeah, and this yeah. is what I've got. Yeah. And um, tell you the truth, I'm new here. Anyway, that happened, and... Your response has made me laugh out loud. Thank you. In our line of work, this is kind of the people we brush elbows with now and then. And you're like, you people are funny. But it's fun because you... it. This is the part that I love working with. Well, there's several reasons I love working with you, Henry Rawlings. Gee, thanks a lot, Heidi May. But really and truly, you right and now. I both have that thing when people are not getting us we both go crazy and it's freaking fun yeah and it's nice <laughs> to be able to say are you high <laughs> no click exactly <laughs> exactly as phil hendry says every now and then and i'm all click <laughs> <laughs> and so heidi may has a, a lot of you know things that she does one of my favorites I was, you know, I live alone. I just, you know, curse the darkness and walk around. Uh, I did a, I did an imitation of her yesterday, I think. I laughed out loud. One time, I think with her, how do you do it with your first two fingers and your thumb? Oh, the hog? You, yeah. <laughs> ah, no, don't. No. Ow, 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 ow. ow. Like Stop that. it. Ow. You have to go like that. Yeah. <laughs> you have to go like that. Okay, th- thanks. <laughs> if I did that back to you, everything on my desk would hit the floor. <laughs> And I'd so, clobber you. <laughs> <laughs> One time, stupidly, I did the hawk while we were driving, and you almost killed us. I'll never do that again. Thanks. <laughs> the drivers of Southern California all collectively thank you and breathe a sigh of relief. But anyway, I was trying to, I think I was on the treadmill, and I was trying to do the hawk out loud. By yourself. I was like, ha ha! <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I don't know why it's Where's so funny. Where's the applause? I don't know why it's so funny to me, but it is. It really is. I can't stand. <laughs> ah! Ow! Stop it! Stop it! Ow! What? That <laughs> hurt my ears. I didn't do it. That hurt my ears. Oh, sonically. That's fair enough. <laughs> Whatever. That, that you deserve. Woo! Wow. I, I, I sweated through my shirt. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, thank you. And a little bit more applause. How's that headache going for you, Heidi? I don't know. I, I feel like I'm a vice. No! What? I'm doing a DJ thing. I'm in the mixy mix. <laughs> God. Yay. What am I doing fading out my voice? Okay, the show's over. And this is like the after the show moments where I say, go fetch my pipe <laughs> and my robe and my slippers. And uh, forget it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, dear listener, the show is over, and that means it's time to get free snacks at your door from NatureBox. With over 100 options to choose from, get the bold flavors you crave and feel smarter about snacking. Go to naturebox.com slash Henry and Heidi 
to start your free, may I say that again, free trial. That's free food from NatureBox. That's naturebox.com slash Henry and Heidi. Do it.